When you, Mr. Secretary, and your Chinese counterpart, when you initiated the G20 process in response to the global financial crisis, that's the kind of cooperation people hardly imagined during the Nixon Kissinger years. Of course, I also took some of the economic causes. Then later on, I found out many of the things you learn in the classroom may not apply in real society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how true that is. How true. So we are still making our best efforts to have further reform and opening up. We will not give up. I think for American companies and other foreign companies operating in China, there will be better access, better opportunities, and certainly a great predictability. In the first two decades of the 21st century, we have had at least three major international crises. The 9-11 terrorist attack, the financial crisis, now the pandemic. These are all global challenges, global issues, but none of them could be solved with the traditional toolbox of great power competition. And all of them have reminded us we have to enhance global governance for better international cooperation. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, Chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Shui Tiankai. He has served as China's ambassador to the United States since March of 2013. He previously served as China's ambassador to Japan and in various other senior positions in China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including as Vice Foreign Minister. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Last year was the 40th anniversary of formal diplomatic relations between our two countries. It's clear that the next 40 years will be very different from the last four decades. Our two countries now make up some 35% of the global economy, and we are top spenders in our military. We're both ambitious with competitive countries, so of course the entire world is watching what we do with or against each other. Being an ambassador during a time of tension is no easy job. I've long respected your professionalism, your equanimity, and the fact that you are striving to understand American perspectives on the relationship and searching for common ground where possible while you represent the government of China. But I'd like to start with how your career began. You were born in 1952. So you were in your 20s when reforms were launched in 1978, which means you've seen a lot of Chinese modern history. What was your pathway to becoming a diplomat? How did your career unfold? How were you influenced by what was happening around you in China at different times? Well, Mr. Secretary, first of all, it's such a great pleasure to talk to you again. And I'm very grateful that you have invited me to this conversation. I was in my 20s when China started to reform and open up. But even before that, I was a young teenager. We had the Cultural Revolution, the chaotic years in China. And even before I could finish my high school, I was sent to a very remote very cold rural area along the Chinese-Russian border. I worked on the farm, growing soybeans and wheat for more than five years. That's how I got to know China's rural area, the problem of poverty. That's how I got to know what the country really needed. So I think the people in my generation, we were very lucky that we spent most of our career during the decades of reform and opening up. And we believe that the country is on the right track. It's the historic mission of my generation of Chinese to do our best to contribute to this modernization drive, to do whatever we can for our country and our people. And I have also been lucky to spend some time here in the United States, both working and studying here. So in a sense, I personally have had some experience, both of rural China, of course, and I was born in Shanghai, the largest city in China, and also experience here in the United States. 
that gave me a very good understanding how our two countries should manage our relation, what we do need from each other, what we can learn from each other. So as for my diplomatic career, I think more or less I was brought here by curiosity. I have always been interested in international issues, global situation, and all these things. So that's how I got myself recruited on a graduate course sponsored by the United Nations in the late 1970s, at the same time when China started to reform and open up. So I was employed by the UN in the early 1980s as a translator in its New York headquarters. And that was my first trip abroad. It was to New York City. So somehow I still like New York City better than Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because so many of the people that I respect in various professions share one thing in common, and that's intellectual curiosity. You know, because it takes intellectual curiosity and, and really you know, real courage to want to travel abroad, experience different cultures and so on. You know, when, when I left Treasury in 2009 to begin working on my book, On the Brink, I spent a year at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Mm. And I see that's where you spent your time when you were a scholar. You got an advanced degree there. Tell me, how did that experience impact your views of America? I think that, that was a very unique experience for me. So I'm still very grateful to SAIS, to John Hopkins, and to my American professors there. Of course, before I went to SAIS, I had already spent a few years working for the UN in New York. But that, that's different. Being a student, you get closer to the American people, and you know more about the American society. Besides, that gave me the opportunity to have a more systematic study of America as a country, of American foreign policy, especially its policy towards China. I think that is extremely helpful for me, for my entire career. Of course, I also took some of the economic causes. Then later on, I found out many of the things you learn in the classroom may not apply in real society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how true that is. How true. So now for the present, relations are at a low point between our two countries. You're right there in Washington, so you see it, you know, with over 400 pieces of legislation in the U.S. Congress aimed at challenging China, introduced by both Republicans and Democrats, this more aggressive approach to China has bipartisan support. In some ways, the change in the relationship was inevitable, right? Because China's as growing economic strength, which is naturally followed by geopolitical ambitions. Let me be candid, though. I, I also believe China brought some of this on itself in some ways. For a long time now, I've consistently said China needs to open to a greater extent and much more quickly to competition from foreign companies. It needs to better protect intellectual property. And together, you know, we should have stepped up to the challenge to lead the effort to reform and update international governing institutions so that they work in today's world. We have a number of difficult, uh, seemingly intractable strategic security and political flashpoints dividing us. Taiwan, Hong Kong, South China Sea, technology issues, on and on. You and I have talked about a lot of these in the past. But rather than debating these points today, I believe our time together would be best spent looking to the future. So I'm going to start by asking you a basic question. What are China's objectives and priorities in establishing a productive relationship with the United States? Our foreign policy is very much based on our perception of our national interests how to advance and promote our national interests in today's world, and how to manage our relations with other countries for the national interest, for what is needed by our people. So in this sense, there is a clear continuity and consistency in China's policy towards the United States. You said last year we celebrated the 40th anniversary of our diplomatic relation. And next year, we'll commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dr. Henry Kissinger's first visit to China. So it's been clear from the very beginning that we want to have a constructive, cooperative, rather than confrontational relationship with the United States. 
We want to base ourselves on mutual respect, mutual understanding, and hopefully mutual accommodation with the aim of mutual benefit. That's been our policy, the, the essence of our policy all along, ever since even Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou Enlai when Nixon and Kissinger visited China. So I don't think there's a fundamental change with regard to this basic approach. But at the same time, our relations have changed a great deal. It has expanded, it has deepened, and it, is, it has got more complicated more comprehensive and more complex. We have opened up many new areas for cooperation, areas that we may not have imagined early on. For instance, when you, Mr. Secretary, and your Chinese counterpart, when you initiated the G20 process in response to the global financial crisis, that's the kind of cooperation people hardly imagined during the Nixon Kissinger years. And we also handled issues like climate change, international terrorism, some of the uh, pandemics like Ebola in Africa. And even for this current pandemic, there's a good degree of cooperation between Chinese provinces, cities, and American states and cities, between companies of two countries and institutions of two countries. So we have opened up many and more areas for cooperation. And we have also handled the differences in a constructive and pragmatic way. To be fair, some of the differences will remain with us for many years to come. We have to recognize that there will always be differences between us because we are two different countries with very different historic heritage, different culture, and different political and economic system. But we have to manage these differences in a very constructive way. And we have always keep in mind that our common interests, our mutual need, always outweighs whatever differences we have. We are faced with so many global challenges. Neither China nor United States can handle them all by itself, whether the pandemic or climate change or natural disasters. And it is the expectation of the international community that China and United States should really work with each other, not against each other, on these global challenges. This is our larger interest, our larger common interest. As for some of the differences, I have to be very frank to say that many of the issues, including some of them you just mentioned, the situation in the Taiwan Strait, situation in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, in South China Sea, if we look at the map, all these places are either part of Chinese territory or very close to China. None of them is very close to the United States. Certainly none of them is part of U.S. territory. So for us, it's a matter of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and national unity. Sometimes we just don't believe why should these issues become issues between our two countries? Because they are internal issues for China. And as the Chinese nation strives to achieve modernization, we have to solve these issues of sovereignty and territorial integrity in the process. But this is our own affairs. But as I said, we do have a very complex relationship. Sometimes we have disputes over these issues. Fortunately, so far, we have managed them quite well. But now the current situation is making us very concerned and even alarmed. There's some clear attempt in this country to try to cross what people might call the red line with very serious consequences. So I hope people can really draw experience, draw the good lessons from the past few decades. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer. Two things I would say. When you talk about areas in your region, you know, like Hong Kong and sovereignty, one of the things that tends to divide us is Americans understand the Chinese sovereignty, for instance, in Hong Kong. But the U.S. side tends to look at it and say, you know, has China breached a sovereign or, or an agreement they had? So there's those differences. They're not going to be easy to, to iron out. I think the thing that's important is that the dialogue, you and your counterparts talking regularly with the top people of the United States, because I think this is a, just a, a very difficult time and some of these issues uh, as you say are intractable not easy to to solve now you mentioned one thing which really resonated with me and which would have been unimaginable during mao's time or 20 or 30 years ago which was during the financial crisis 
And I, I've said the world would have been a very different spot if we didn't have the, the relationship we had, the constructive relationship, if I hadn't been able to get my counterpart at the time, Vice Premier Wang Xishong, now Vice President Wang Xishong, on the phone at, a, at very short notice. And, and the coordination and cooperation there during the time of panic was extremely important. And then the G20, after the financial crisis, the way our two countries came together with other leading nations and the big role that China played with the fiscal stimulus program, helping to lift the whole world out of that recession. So that was a really good example of cooperation. I'd like to move to the Chinese economy a bit and have a question for you there. Your country appears to be rebounding pretty quickly, the economy, after you know, you've brought the pandemic under control. And um, President Xi has announced a focus on stimulating domestic consumption, the so-called internal circulation model. One question that a number of people in the United States are asking, with the emphasis on economic self-reliance, which probably means some delinking, at least more delinking from the global economy, to what extent does that represent a change from the message, which has been constant really over the last 40 years, about opening up? Under the current circumstances, of course, the priority is to overcome the difficulties brought by the uh, pandemic to restore and reopen the economy. And we are working very hard on that. And so far, I think we have had some good news. The Chinese economic growth is, is coming back. And at the same time, I think we believe we should always try to turn challenges into opportunities and to speed up and deepen the transformation of China's economic development mode to aim at high quality development instead of high growth rate and to protect the environment more effectively. Of course, to eliminate absolute poverty in the process. And we are doing all this as part of our efforts to restore economic growth and to try to have a more stable and sustainable economic development going forward. Now we are preparing for the 14th five-year plan, which will start next year. And the emphasis is very clear. As you said, we would like to have this new development pattern with both the uh, internal and external cycles reinforcing each other, but maybe with the internal one as a mainstay. But this does not mean we'll close our doors. This does not mean we'll have a closed internal loop all by itself. Actually, we will have an even wider opening in the process. As for the concept of self-reliance, I think there's always this kind of self-reliance throughout the 70 years and more since the People's Republic was founded in 1949, including in the four decades of reform and opening up. There's always this spirit, this element of self-reliance. So in this regard, I think it's extremely unfair to say that China has become the second largest economy in the world by just taking advantage of others or even by stealing something from others. I think this is extremely unfair for the Chinese people. You know China and Chinese so well. We have very hardworking people, very creative people. And we understand for such a big country, for 1.4 billion people, you must have this spirit of self-reliance to develop. Otherwise, you can never achieve development. So this self-reliance is always there, but it's not closed door. We'll open our door even wider because the real aim is to give full play to the potential of the domestic market, to make the domestic market function more effective and much better. So the two cycles could really reinforce each other. And actually, I think for many foreign companies, including American companies, they are already operating in China. So actually, they are already part of this domestic cycle. They are already part of the domestic market. With great emphasis on the internal market forces, they will have better prospects to develop, to grow their operation in China. And at the same time, there is a natural link between the internal cycle and the external cycle. So that would mean great opportunities for them. I hope they will seize the opportunities. 
you know, what's interesting is I, as I listened to you, I thought back to 2007, 2000, late 2006 and 2007, when I was Treasury Secretary and we set up the Strategic Economic Dialogue. And the two major issues which were focused on there was currency reform, the idea of, of having China move toward having a currency that wasn't undervalued, it was more reflective of market forces, and a rebalancing economically, because in those days, China produced much more than it consumed, saved much more than it spent, and that consumption production imbalance was you know, about 10% of China's economy. And we were encouraging China, pushing China to reduce that and to start consuming more. And it's interesting that today, progress has been made in both of those. We have a host of other issues that I mentioned, but in terms of the currency, there's been great progress on the currency and great progress in moving toward uh, solving the imbalance between consumption and, and, and production. So, you know, I, I think that's worth pointing out. I'd like to now move to something that you touched on earlier and just maybe spend a minute or two more on it, which was international coordination and cooperation. The failure to work together on the pandemic has been a huge miss. And, you know, some people say, boy, if we can't work together and cooperate on that, what can we cooperate on? But today, the world just generally seems to lack an ability to have collective action, you know, at a time when it's most needed, whether it's on the pandemic response, the economic recovery, trade, or issues like climate change or nuclear proliferation. So I'd like to, you know, again, look a bit to the future and say, what is China willing to do to be part of the solution to achieve progress on these common goals or in support of reforming existing institutions such as the uh, World Trade Organization? Well, sir, I think there's a clear need to enhance global governance in all these areas. You see, in the first two decades of the 21st century, we have had at least three major international crises, the 9-11 terrorist attack, the financial crisis, now the pandemic. These are all global challenges, global issues, but none of them could be solved with the traditional toolbox of great power competition. And all of them have reminded us we have to enhance global governance for better international cooperation. So we in China, we are ready to support and contribute to this kind of agenda efforts to make global governance more responsive, more effective, and help all of us to deal with not only the current challenges, maybe upcoming challenges in the years to come. And this kind of a better global governance system will certainly require the participation and contribution of all the countries, but maybe particularly great powers like China and the United States. I think it's our shared responsibility to the world that we should take the lead in cooperating with each other, in initiating and supporting and contributing to international cooperation to deal with all these challenges. And of course, this governance system will have to take into account the needs and aspirations of all the members. So I really hope that we could do a much better job in handling the current pandemic, and we should really work together and, as you said, look to the future, what the post-pandemic world would be like, what the post-pandemic world would need from us, from our cooperation. I think we have to look to the future, we have to plan ahead, we have to really work with each other instead of against each other. Yeah, I tell you, that's well said, because the world's going to be a very difficult, dangerous place. We can't do this. If, if, if we care about peace and stability and order, there's a lot of work to be done. I'd like to, to, to move to trade and tech decoupling and talk about this issue, because it's a hot-button issue. As you know, there's real pressure 
for significantly decoupling trade and capital flows between the U.S. and China and technology. So th there's no doubt that's going to happen to some extent. The question is, to what extent? How far is this going to go? So let me start the discussion by asking a sort of a tougher question. What do you say to Americans who are frustrated with how little China has opened up to our tech companies? I think for the last four decades, China has implemented this policy of reform and opening up. And this remains a basic state policy. It will not change. Even at the time of such a global pandemic, we have initiated new measures for reform and opening up in the last few months. For instance, the new foreign investment law took into effect January 1st this year. There's certainly better predictability and better confidence for foreign investors in China. And China is still attracting a lot of foreign investment. And also, last June, just a couple of months ago, we announced the 2020 version of negative list for the access of foreign investment and the negative list for pilot free trade zones. And the negative list is getting shorter and shorter. And also, also in last June, we started this master plan for the development of Hainan free trade port. And it's the first time in official Chinese government document, the idea of zero tariff and zero barrier are used. So we're still making our best efforts to have further reform and opening up. We will not give up. I think for American companies and other foreign companies operating in China, there will be better access, better opportunities, and certainly great predictability. But at the same time, what is very challenging for us is that while we are trying to be more open to the rest of the world, some people in other parts of the world are trying to raise barriers to us. You mentioned TikTok, WeChat, and Huawei, and all, all these things. They are raising barriers. So this is a real challenge for us. We are trying to open our door wider, but they are building walls, they are raising barriers. What should we do? Well, as I said, I think this is the most difficult area, technology, which is what has essentially happened. There was the thought that economic linkages between our two countries would mitigate security competition. But as you and I have talked about, security competition has bled over into the economic side and technology is the focus. So the question is national security and how far we go. And th that is the most difficult issue. To get to an issue that is easier, which is, will China's markets continue to open further for U.S. companies in areas where the U.S. is most competitive, such as energy and agriculture and finance? The answer is certainly yes. Actually, we have opened our financial sector more in the last couple of years. We have removed some of the uh, restrictions on foreign investment in the financial sectors. And also, for many very good high-tech American companies, they are increasing their investment or their operation in China. Companies like Tesla is a good example because they see the market potential. They want to be part of China's economic growth. They want to contribute to it and they certainly want to benefit from it. So we welcome them all, and we'll create much better environment for foreign investment, better rule of law, and all these things. As for national security, naturally, there's always concern of national security for all countries, all along. This is not a new issue. This does not come up all of a sudden where somebody has to worry about national security. A huge number of people are always worried about national security. But look at the history of the past 40 years or 50 years. Both China and United States have taken good care of its national security while we develop our mutual ties, while we deepen and widen our relations. I don't think the national security of either China or United States has been hurt in the process. Actually, it's been helped. If you have more interaction with each other, you know better the other side. You know how the, the guys on the other side think what their mindset, their strengths, their weaknesses, and you know 
much better how to deal with them, how to avoid the risks, how to promote mutually beneficial cooperation. I think that this is the experience, the historic experience we have learned over the last 40 or 50 years. Why should change it? Well, I think you said something that is, is very wise here, that obviously China has changed dramatically, US has changed, the world's changed, there are new national security issues, but the key thing is understanding and talking and talking about areas where we agree, where there are differences, where there's potential conflict, how to avoid conflict from spinning out of control. I think that's what's really important. Now, I would like to sort of go from there to asking you to think reflectively. You, you've been in the U.S. now for over seven years. You've seen a lot. You were here for the U.S.-China Agreement on Climate Change preceding the Paris Agreement. Transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. The meeting with President Trump and President Xi at Mar-a-Lago. The long, arduous trade negotiations. <laughs> you were right, you know, see you right there in the Oval Office with Vice Premier Leo Ha and President Trump and today's dangerous decline in relationships between our two countries. Looking back, what is your biggest regret over the last seven years or so? Well, Mr. Secretary, maybe first one more word about this uh, national security issue. I think that the national security concerns, generally speaking, these are legitimate concerns for all countries, but we have to be careful not to be misled, not to be blinded, certainly not, not to be trapped by groundless fear, suspicion, and even hatred. I don't think that, that will make anybody safe. That will make everybody less secure. This is just against the need for national security. So about my own experience being ambassador here for more than seven years, honestly, I have to confess, when I first came here, I didn't expect that I would stay here for so long. So some of my friends asked me, why didn't you leave right after Mar-a-Lago? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. Maybe if I had left earlier, the situation would be somehow better than now. I don't know. But I, I feel grateful, Mr. Secretary. I do feel grateful that I'm doing this job at this critical moment for both our countries. This is most probably my last posting abroad in my diplomatic career. And our relations between our two countries are faced with such tremendous challenges. So I'm grateful I've been given this opportunity to do this job here, to meet the challenges. I think that this is my dedication to my country, my people, and this is what I owe to all my American friends. I have to work with all of you to make sure that our relation will come back on the right track, it will move forward, it will be stabilized, especially in the next few months. And probably with more efforts, we can open up new opportunities for further cooperation. So I know you never look to personalize things, but as you think back, what are you most pleased to have been part of? I think I'm lucky to be witnessing so many historic moments. I've been present at almost all the meetings between our two presidents, including meetings between President Xi and President Obama, but also meetings between President Xi and President Trump. I have first-hand knowledge about how the two presidents interact with each other and how their agreement has guided our relation forward. As we always say, you should always aim at something better. You should always have a higher standard for, for yourself to reach. So maybe I'll still be here for a few months. I'll try to do that. So looking ahead, what keeps you up at night as you look to the future? What do you see as the biggest risks in the relationship between our two countries? And then I'm going to ask you after that, on a positive note, what do you see as the biggest opportunities? Well, Mr. Secretary, nowadays I very often ask myself before I fall asleep at night, how will future historians judge us 20 years, 30 years from now? Will they say we have made the right choice? We have done our best for the relation for the two countries. I'm asking this question to myself very often now. 
I think going forward, there is clear new opportunities for our two countries to strengthen our cooperation, to build a stronger relations between us. One of these opportunities is cooperation to deal with the current pandemic, to develop treatment, cures, possible vaccines to save lives, to protect people's livelihood, to protect jobs, to restart economic growth, to give people better confidence about the economic prospects. And uh, we should also resume and strengthen our cooperation on issues like climate change and even on some of the international hotspot issues, conflicts like the uh, Korean Peninsula, the Iranian nuclear issue. There are so many of them. If there's a sufficient political will for cooperation, certainly the opportunities are there. Yeah, I think it all, you're right, comes down to political will. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being with us today. I'll now let you get back to your critically important job. And I can tell you, I, for one, am very grateful that you're here in this country during this very important, important and difficult time. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.